Welcome to the Signs of the Marvel Universe. My name is Ryan Consul and I'll be your moderator today. This will most mostly be a question and answer period where you guys go, well, there's this thing in the Marvel Universe uh, like this, how does that work? And then we make stuff up until you believe it could happen. <laughs> uh, so you will notice that the room is very full of humans. Uh, which means we have to play some ground rules and I may have to be cruel and rude to you at times. Uh, questions have to be questions. Uh, I believe that there are probably people in this room with more expertise on the subject than me and probably some of the other panelists. Uh, we don't get to hear all of your thoughts on the subject. Right then. We don't have time. Uh, so if your question can fit in a tweet, it is a good question. If your question cannot fit in a tweet, don't ask it. Um, I will do my best to sort of pick people out. A few people just throw up their hands. I'll do something like this. One, two, and I'll make those sort of gestures to know that I've noted you and eventually you'll get to ask the question. Um, those questions will likely start with something related to that answer and then we'll wander off in horrible tangents and never get to your question. But that's just how these things go. All right, does anybody have any questions about that? Good. Um, <laughs> Moving on to introductions, my name is Ryan Consul. I am a fantasy author, also a blogger at madartlab.com, also a Masters of Applied Science in Breaking Bicycles. To my right is... I'm Topher Hunter, I'm a biomedical engineer, PhD in bioengineering, uh, and I work at a medical device manufacturer, so basically medicine and such is where I'm going to be bullshitting. Um, and I also blog at one of the skeptic uh, blogs at Ground Parents. And he already has an adamantium skeleton to my left. I'm Jennifer Willette. I'm not sure my mic is on. Okay. Uh, I'm a science writer and blogger. I have a blog at Science America called Contemporary Physics. Uh, for two years, I ran a program called the Science Entertainment Exchange for the National Academy of Sciences. And we worked, among other people, at Marvel uh, Studios. So uh, I've been involved in helping uh, with science consulting on many of those films, including. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Jim Pichelius. I'm a physics professor and, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and also, also the author of Physics for Superheroes. space on the periodic table. There's a cool little space off that there might be another island of stability, but that doesn't actually make really good sort of indestructible metals. So, nowhere close. Adamantium can't be a thing. It's really sad. Nanotubes 
are very, very strong. Their tensile strength might be comparable to adamantium, but the problem is when we talk about materials, we're talking about, and we say strength, in a room like this, most people go strength, that means one thing. In engineering terms, it means a very specific thing. That means how hard it is to pull something apart or crush it, tensile strength versus compressive strength, or torsional strength, but that's usually a combination of two. I'll shut up. Um, <laughs> other important things are toughness um, and hardness. So adamantium is not only incredibly strong, it is also incredibly tough, and it is incredibly hard. Hard things keep their edge. Diamonds are the hardest substance there is. Carbon bonds are the strongest bonds that can be. Um, so carbon nanotubes have carbon bonds. Those can be really, really strong. Um, and that means they're very, very hard. But that doesn't mean they can't break. If you take a diamond and a hammer, and they have a fight, the hammer will be scratched because the diamond is very hard. The diamond will not be scratched at all. However, that diamond will be a pile of powder that is not scratched because the hammer is very tough. Trying to get all of those properties into one thing and then gluing it to somebody's skeleton is probably not uh, happening very close. But that does spin off onto, are we anywhere close to improving the human skeleton with uh, metal glued to them? I knew you were going there. Um, so, I work in a medical device manufacturer. We produce uh, hips, knees, elbows, shoulders, all that kind of stuff. There are systems out there, not just by my company, that are used in, say, severe oncology or large trauma cases, so where you had to have a huge cancerous tumor removed from your thigh bone, um, or where your leg has just been completely crushed in an accident. We can replace from the hip joint, the entire femur, so the entire thigh bone, and the knee joint, and a good chunk of the tibia, or your shin bone, all with basically it's primarily cobalt chrome and titanium and polyethylene plastic. Really cool because it's basically, look, I can either cut your leg off, or we can try to use this but those patients are in a world of hurt. So yes, we can currently give you a metallic skeleton, at least in your, your extremities, uh, but you really don't want it if you have an option. So five years then? <laughs> Peeled it apart, 
the graphite cleaved in part by the scotch tape. Then he put some more tape, he peeled it apart, more tape, he peeled it apart, until eventually he got a layer of flake that was one atom thick. And that is what we call graphene. When it's one atom thick, the electrons travel through that material faster than they do in a metal, so it's like a super metal, and yet the bonds are stronger than they are in any other type of covalently bonded material that we know. Of. You have a sheet of paper, you just hold it, and it bends under its own weight. If it was a sheet of graphene, not only would it not bend under its own weight, but you and a friend could stand on the end, and it still wouldn't bend. That's how strong it is. So it's actually 10 times stronger, 10 times more bulletproof than steel. And about three to four times more bulletproof than Kevlar. So, and since it's only one atom thick, 97% of the light passes through it. So if you ever wondered what would make an invisible force field like this, it would be crappy. So the only problem is, so right now if you have a pencil and some scotch tape at home, <laughs> the only equipment you need to do actually literally Nobel Prize winning work. He got the Nobel Prize in 2010 for this. So right. this would be what you would do at Avantium. The only problem is we can only make it in these little flakes that are about as large as like a human cell. Um, a little bit larger than that, maybe 10 cells. If you can figure out how to make it on a mass production, please let me know, because I will totally steal your idea. <laughs> so I can become rich and go off to Stockholm. All right, at risk of spending our entire uh, session on adamantium. Uh, so how does Spider-Man save Mary Jane from falling off the bridge without totally snapping her neck? Gwen Stacy, he tried <laughs> lots of practice. <laughs> so the question was, how might Spider-Man save Mary Jane or any of the other dozens and dozens of people that fall off buildings when he's around uh, without snapping their neck, uh, liquefying their insides from the G-force deceleration uh, when he catches them? I saw this on the thing. Right. He has to match the speed as he, 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 he catches catches Mary Jane or anyone else. He can then he shoots his webbing. He's got spider spread, so he can take it. He can take those G forces and to counter that. The thing with the spider, the Superman actually, I found in like the 1950s somebody wrote to a Superman comic complaining about this, <laughs> and the editor wrote saying, obviously you missed the fact that right before he catches Lois, he blows a pump of super air. And then grabs her, you know, obviously. <laughs> super bad, <laughs> super bright. Yeah. <laughs> Entirely sensible. Uh, yeah, so j just bring this in, spider strength. And so if you check a spider off a building that's as big as a person, how, how, how do they fare? <laughs> if you got a spider that's as big as a person, they're already dead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, bring a sunshine. For <laughs> 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 but why? <laughs> uh, please build on this. Uh, this is this is actually one of the first things I actually looked at in the science of as a child was the whole idea of uh, these small animals that have this incredible strength and how that could be applied to people. And the, and the sad and unfortunate thing about this is that it's be, that it can't be applied to people because it's because they're small. The way that, <coughs> the way that, uh, that, mu that all muscle tissue, most for the most part, muscle tissue kind of functions on a very similar physical principle. And the reason why, uh, how little there is force is a matter of surface area to volume ratio. As you get smaller, the ratio, the ratio between surface area and volume is like surface area has more presence. As you get larger, surface, uh, surface area doesn't increase as fast as volume does. So this effectively shapes all uh, biomechanics in nature. It's the reason why certain creatures can uh, pass, uh, can like exchange heat easier than others. It's the reason why certain 
kind of have our stronger and others. The reason why elephants, though much bigger than us, are pound for pound not as strong because they are having to exert force for a much larger volume of energy on the surface area. Spiders and insects are very powerful because they are so small and they have more surface area to work with compared to their body weight to generate force. That's why they're so powerful. If you scaled up an insect to human size, they would now have to, they would no longer have that ratio and they would no longer be able to generate those kind of forces. In fact, they would not even be able to, they would not even be able to really move or walk because their skeletons are built on the principle they don't, that they don't have to be very, they don't, that they can generate so much strength at a small size. If they were larger, their skeletons would be far too heavy. They wouldn't be able to move, they wouldn't even be able to uh, exchange gases to get oxygen. So the idea of uh, the, a proportional strength of a spider is not function. You would have to fundamentally change how the biochemistry of muscle fibers and other structure would work in order for someone who is human size to have that same proportional type of strength. All right. Awesome. Thank you. I believe you are next. I was just going to say, wait, bring it up for everything that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that is not a question. <laughs> Over uh, the sudden increase in mass and the and the problem with rel like relativistic effects and, and fusion on that, and just be like stretch pants. All right, go ahead. <laughs> I was just to say his pants are held on by a power even stronger than gamma radiation. <laughs> Comics code authority. <laughs> yeah, they uh, they have addressed. They addressed this whole issue with the pants in a variety of ways. First being just kind of ignoring it. And some of these pants for reasons don't act, don't actually get destroyed. There have been a few comics that they've gone into where you know, where he's transformed, he's off he's like off scene, but his pants are gone. They have been destroyed by this. In some of the later issues, uh, they have had uh, Bruce Banner go to some of his other science friends, and they have made him. They have like there's a there's a particular issue where. Where Reed Richards had made him specially designed pants that can expand and contract. They they built off of this a lot. One of the next course had was uh, some of their research that they have their own suits are made out of what was just unstable molecules that were designed to actually change properties uh, based off of their abilities. So being able to burst into flames, stretch, turn invisible, and whatnot. They they never really go into how they can do this. So we will! <laughs> but that is one of the things they use to uh, explain why he, you know, his Hulk junk is not flying around. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, unstable molecules that can solve all problems. What are they? Unstable molecules are usually things that you don't want around. It's Hulk Spanks. <laughs> All right, we have a bit of a lineup of questions. There was a uh, floppy hat man there, I believe, was first in line, uh, uh, in front of Green Jacket first with our arm up. Um, so, you were talking about how if you grow an insect really large, it becomes unstable. How about a character like Ant Man, where you take human physiology and you shrink it down? Would that kill someone? Excellent. Uh, to repeat this to the audience. Oh, we talked about making bugs big. What about making people small? We've got Ant-Man. Movie coming out soon. That's fine, right? Big person. We're just going to make them. It's kind of sad. Yeah, that's not a problem there. Um, yeah, there's, there's some really fun physics things that would happen if you suddenly change that much mass. Um, and I'm going to jump those over on the physical people and talk about what would happen if you made a person that teeny tiny. Um, and, and it kind of gets back to the question of skeletons again. Um, insects and spiders work because they have their skeleton on the outside. And they're also a big blob on the inside. Uh, and they have a completely different respiratory system than we do. Um, insects in particular do not have blood that carries oxygen. Um, so it doesn't really matter that they, they, don't, they don't have lungs. 
because they're, every single cell in their body is connected through a series of tubes like the internet <laughs> <laughs> to the outside. Um, and it's this amazing transfer system. Uh, and so they're able to get oxygen to all the cells in their body when they're doing something like lifting heavy things. Human bodies, or for that matter, just any small mammal, there's some like things like, like bumblebee bats and really teeny tiny mammals, they just don't work well at a tiny size. Um, because as the body gets smaller, right, all of our oxygen molecules that are supposed to carry oxygen, there's not a whole lot smaller that can get. Our cells cannot get a whole lot smaller. Um, and so basically, he's going to pretty much immediately be like, <laughs> um, because he can't breathe. There's no way to breathe. There's no way to get circulatory system moving. Um, that would be one of many ways that he can die. <laughs> but do you, can you guys address the changing size? Well, that's really fun. I actually have, you know, I want to like set up a question and then let Jim answer it because this is the key thing for me. And if you're shrinking from a human-sized person down to a small size, where does the exercise go? You exactly. really only have yes. two options there. It gets radiated away, it turns into energy and radiated away, or it gets super, super dense, in which case that could be another way for him to die because if it got really dense, it would crush all those vital organs. So, Jim, how are you going to solve this problem? <laughs> I had given this more thought <laughs> than most really of the silly. other physics professors that I know. <laughs> and actually, I will answer it by giving a plug for my talk tomorrow. So tomorrow, I listed as giving a talk, Physics of Everyday Things. And when I realized that I had agreed to do this, I, real I looked at what I had been spending the last few weeks on, and so I've changed the title of the talk to The Physics of Ant-Man. <laughs> and actually the title is Ant-Man, The Physics of Shrink Shrinking, and The Higgs Boson. <laughs> and so I figured out how to connect The Higgs Boson to Ant-Man. And people say, well, there's only two ways to shrink. You either like take the, take the mass out, or you squeeze the atoms closer together. Neither one of them makes sense. I figured out a third way, and it, I figured out what pin particles are actually doing. So I'm just going to, how do I, how do you leave a room full of geeks in suspense? <laughs> so what time is that panel is tomorrow? That, that panel is tomorrow at 11. Are you guys still all going to be here at 11 a.m. tomorrow? Exactly. Yeah. That is where right. I would be. <laughs> All right, I believe there was a... a but there was a third one. Yeah, you were the number three. Uh, yes, but we're going to ignore it entirely. So no more Ant-Man questions, because all of your answers will be given tomorrow. All right, yes. So if vibranium absorbs all vibration, is there any reason Captain America's shield would still clang when struck? <laughs> I can justify the <laughs> cat of this one. Um, so, absorbs all vibration is the sort of thing that you might hand-wavingly say uh, to somebody that doesn't know a lot of calculus. Um, I did used to do this a lot to my students. Because um, your black shirts absorb all light, right? You've been told that. No, they don't. They absorb most visible light. So, the fact that the vibranium shield absorbs a lot of frequencies of vibration, sure. Also, uh, that shield bounces off something, that something is still going to vibrate. So the thing it hits will clang. Um, now if you read what happens to that vibration as it gets absorbed by the shield, uh, what should happen when something absorbs that vibration, uh, it does one of two things. It warms up, or it deforms. So either his shield is made as plasticine, or it gets very warm. According to the Marvel science books, it actually gets harder. <laughs> now, that's not ludicrous. There's a thing called work hardening. If you, if you can do it with a paper clip, you bend it back and forth, and you'll notice the place you bend it, it doesn't want to bend as much anymore. And eventually, it'll get very hard, and it'll be hard to bend, and then it'll crack. Um, Okay, we're going back to the difference between toughness and hardness. You don't actually want a shield to be incredibly hard, because then it shatters like glass when it gets hit by a bullet. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, it can absorb most vibrations. 
still make noises, still bounce. Anybody else want to jump in with me? I just want to, well, perhaps the also was going to say there's like solar luminescence, maybe it gets transformed to lightning. No. Which is why when, you know, Thor strikes Cat's Hammer and Avengers, you see this huge flash of light because they couldn't put it in the movie if it wasn't true. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to point out that we've actually discovered recently that lots of other metals um, can be used in the shield. Liquid mercury can be uh, used to stop bullets. I mean, Hawkeye's oh shield was made of quicksilver. <laughs> <laughs> styles in the movies, I mean, I, I can see that part of it is realistic, but then, you know, sorry. Um. <laughs> what do you think about the martial arts styles in the movies? <coughs> well, uh, I, think, I think with movies and uh, martial arts forms in those, <laughs> it's in uh, my friends always mock me for this, but I'll actually go to the movie and I'll find out what the styles of the choreographers are and I'm watching them. The, the like, a good speech review would be in the, uh, in Winter Soldier, a lot of that was built off of, of uh, Philippine martial arts style. You have a lot of the you know, small, small knives, a lot of the uh, stick fighting. The the angular, the, kind of the angular strikes and kind of the rhythm of it is very, very prominent. These are this is actually kind of a very common style in a lot of uh, in a lot of uh, current movies. You kind of see that progression between like, more Japanese, Korean styles in like the early 80s, 90s. Now more Chinese style, especially with. Jackie Chan and Jet Li movies became more popular, moving into now a mixture of Chinese styles, Philippine styles showing up. Captain America's trying to sell is they don't really talk a lot about it. In terms of, they kind of kind of say, like, he's learned everything, even though he uh, trained for like a few months uh, at one military base and then was perfectly frozen and knows all fighting styles on Earth somehow for reasons <laughs> and ways. I mean, what? At the time that Captain America was actually training, there was a there were particularly new program that came out, the World War II Combatives Program. It was created uh, by um, um, William Fairburn, and then later taught to Rex Applegate, who was William Fairburn British, and Rex Applegate, who was an uh, uh, American who took over to the US. And those are the most British, British and most American names. Those <laughs> sound <laughs> I, I really wish they, they were the name they're not. <laughs> uh, they, he actually, uh, uh, Fairburn actually used a mixture of traditional European fighting styles, boxing, some uh, European wrestling, a little bit of French savant. And he mixed it when he was uh, in uh, Shanghai, he mixed it with little elements of Chinese martial arts and Japanese martial arts. And this became the basis for hand-to-hand -hand combat for World War II training. So these would have been the first basis that you would have actually, that he, Captain America, would have, would have absorbed. So what they were, so in terms of the fighting styles you see in the movies currently, well, probably wouldn't look a lot like it would be similar, it wouldn't look entirely like what he would have actually been writing for. Now, over the course of World War II, he also continued training. He was in many parts of the world and would have absorbed probably other elements of techniques, but typically, um, both on a cultural level and a personal level, people tend to cluster around whatever is most reliable for them. And the styles are kind of really, really simple. So this fighting style, and then somehow just absorbs some kind of shield fighting technique, he more or less developed himself. Shield fighting, like, there's really no reference to where he figured that out. It's apparently they gave, he had some basic training, they gave him a shield, he went out into war and, and had to figure out how not to die. And because he's still alive, he, he apparently made it work. <laughs> so I would say, with most, with most, I can summarize, with most martial arts in films, they are designed to be a little more flashy, a little more wider strikes, partly because people need to be able to see them. And, Make them more, a little more flashy, but in most cases, like I mean, the actual combat or even the sports or in the martial arts techniques are a lot more closed in. They are more, they are more subtle, and fights are over a lot more quickly. Usually, someone, oh, I've been threatened, I'm gonna 
punch in the throat and I'm going to run away. <laughs> so, I believe the standard practice if you watch a lot of UFC is hug and fall over. <laughs> where somebody figured out follow through and wind up are much more important than the connection when illustrated comics. Uh, and this follows through to uh, the movies as well. If I show you this part of the punch, this is boring. This, does, this just looks like I'm touching Topher. But if I show you this part, you can see how much force went into it. And if I show you this part, you can see how much energy is going to go into it. But the actual point of connection is super boring. Because nothing has happened yet. There's no consequence. It's just, yeah, but. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see that, and there's some really old Hulk panels. You can see that. You can be like, wow, that Hulk's really just sort of fist bumping. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> All right. Uh, Riddler, I believe you were next. So how did Spider-Man uh, go up the walls of Clay even when he has his suit over his hands and his little boobies on his feet? <laughs> How can Spider-Man climb walls, any walls, uh, when he's wearing uh, spandex over his hands and feet. <laughs> how do spiders stay like? Yeah, how do bugs stick to walls to start with? I mean, I think that gets back to the to the problem I have with Spider-Man in general, which is where is that webbing really coming from? If you know anything about spider anatomy, it's just wrists. understands where she's going with this, understands where she's going with this, and we'll let your imaginations take it from there. Um, but in general, how do bugs stick to walls? Um, it has, actually has to do with Van der Waals forces, and Jim can actually speak to this as well. Um, there's actually a lot of work being done with biomedic materials, uh, specifically trying to copy gecko feet. Um, geckos, even more than spiders, <coughs> have tiny little hairs, these things that kind of stick out, and it just interacts in such a way with the surface that they're able to crawl off the surfaces. We're going to ask for a really shallow atomic level. <laughs> um, so there's charges in the atoms in everything, and they're fluctuating and moving around. And sometimes the front end of the atom is a little bit more negative, sometimes a little bit more positive. And that can induce an opposite charge, say, in the wall, and the opposite charge is attracted. These are fluctuating charges, so they're not real charges. The gecko is not rubbing his feet on a shag carpet to charge himself up. So they're very weak. So you need to get very close to the wall, which is why these fibers are small. So the surface area to volume ratio is big. You, the forces are very weak, which is why the fiber, there's millions of these filaments per little pad for the gecko. Andre Keen, who got the Nobel Prize for graphene, also, before that, was developing gecko tape. And he published a paper in Nature Materials that showed the gecko tape in action, 
I'm holding up a Spider-Man action figure. <laughs> <laughs> this was published in an issue of Nature um, up against the wall, held up not with glue, but using this gecko tape that had uh, artificially made millions of these little fibers. And when I met Keem, I told him how upset I was because I thought if there was anyone who was going to publish a physics paper that featured a Spider-Man action figure, <laughs> it was going to be me. <laughs> <laughs> My nemesis. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that, you know, particularly uh, in the the, the, the uh, Spider-Man movies, when, when you, the origin story, when you first see Tobey Maguire's uh, turning into a spider, you actually see that he looks at his hand and there's all these little hairs poking out. So they really did try to adjust, address the, uh, the issue of animals right. versus. And he must have special gloves and boots that allow these. The webbing is a whole other <laughs> issue, but the actual climbing up the wall is not has nothing to do with the webbing. It has everything to do with those little hairs. Yes, which go right through his sneakers in that first scene. <laughs> they they actually in the comics that did actually come up is that they they did ignore the sneakers thing in the break the issues. That the reason why his costume is part of what he made it is that the, the soles of the feet are very thin. It is basically a very thin uh, standard material that allows him to. Allows the really constrict walls to actually go through the material and that different materials. Although again, they kind of forget about that they even went over this in some of the other comics. Different materials impede his ability. There is also another part during the clone saga where they get more into the uh, some of the upside of abilities where one of his clones, Kane, has amplified qualities of all spider man's abilities, enhanced strength, um, enhanced enhanced spider sense. What they get into is that there was some kind of biochemical reaction that is actually happening that is generating an electrostatic force, especially one that is actually kind of similar, like something that you could actually, you can like transport a charge like into a balloon, but it's so strong it came, you could actually burn people with it. So there was an implication that effectively it looks like a lot like an electric eel of sorts. <laughs> <laughs> and, and uses that in order to cling to walls. And uh, if you keep developing that, you know. I, I, I love, I love Marvel. But the thing we casually just threw in there needs no explanation. The Clone Saga, where one of his clones. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I thought this was a serious panel. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, I believe there was, uh, was it you? There was somebody I pointed to a while ago, was that you? I, I think I was a while ago, yeah. Okay, okay. it was, yeah, not was somebody a while ago, way back there, but your heads are very tiny from here, so yeah. I'll just believe you. All right, um, so my question is, Magneto has, they, the comics say that he can control magnetic force, but he clearly controls metals that are not magnetic in the slightest. He's been shown to control hemoglobin. Um, is there any theory on what's actually going on and how he can right, control um, rusted copper? Not, so for those who are not familiar with Magneto, over his run, his powers include magnetic hypnotism, <laughs> uh, levitating everything, astral projection, uh, creating force fields that will stop anything. But uh, I guess the, the thing that most commonly comes up is uh, doing things, uh, using magnetism to control things that are not ferromagnetic. That is pretty much iron and steel products. Can that happen? And what? <laughs> the first thing that the first thing that pops to my mind is um, well, okay, lots of things pop to my mind. Um, not all of them are, are utterable in this audience. Um, my, my, probably my biggest problem with aside from the whole like why is he able to control all these various non ferromagnetic materials is basically just force vectors. Uh, magnetic fields are relatively, I mean, within a certain spot within the field, the force is unidirectional. And yet he can envelop this, this he, can, he can lift things in, in any direction, move them in any direction, which is crazy. And then you add in the fact that when you apply a magnetic field to a metallic uh, substance, you induce eddy currents in that metal and those eddy currents generally either radiate electromagnetic energy or they, uh, um, they, they cause the metal to heat up. This is a big problem for us in metallic medical devices because if you have a device and then you go inside an MRI for a diagnostic test, an MRI is a giant magnet. And so your implant can start to heat up and it 
it's really not pleasant for the patient uh, to have a giant uh, heat source inside of their body. Um, yeah, so there are, there, there are lots of issues, and I don't have a solution for them. I think, uh, but rolling back, some of the things that he does do with things that are not magnetic, uh, it does work, because electromagnetic fields are like, uh, if you can get them oscillating, spinning, moving, you can do lots of really neat things like with them, like image the human brain. Uh, so that is just a combination of spinning magnetic fields and seeing how they interact with the matter within them. So if he has really strong fields that he can vary and move uh, with incredible, incredible precision, he can do things like control a crane, or melt something, or um, create a barrier that would be very hard for a lot of things to cross. Uh, but that requires sort of, I don't know, star, the surface of a star level magnetic fields to make that really matter. But sure, why not? He can do that. He's Magneto. <laughs> I, I believe Magneto wasn't right, but he made some very valid points. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, magnetism can do a lot of neat things if you can make it move. Uh, but most of what it does is heat things up. So melting fillings would be a really easy power. You could, do a lot of really power. You could just walk around and be in a reduction furnace yeah. and just fry all the metal. Yeah, even as dumb as one, magnetic hypnotism, technically possible. <laughs> <laughs> because with strong enough magnetic fields, you can affect the electric uh, interaction, electrochemical interactions inside a brain. Now, you're much more likely to just kill someone who tried <laughs> What is really good? All right, I believe it was you, and then you, and then the man with the flailing arms at the back can go out and go, yeah. All right, um, my question is about Hawkeye's script arrows. How many of them could exist, and how would they work? I'm specifically thinking of the boomerang arrow. <laughs> <laughs> because boomerangs. Where do we begin? All right, to repeat the question, we're curious about Hawkeye's trick arrows. How many could exist? Well, you could make them out of the whole planet into trick arrows if we really wanted to. Um, but can the boomerang arrow exist? Can the uh, uh, exploding net arrow exist? Can the tracking device arrow exist? Can the explosive arrow exist? Can the knockout arrow exist? There's lots of them. Let's start through the list. What are your favorites? I think we're going to have to go to our comic book experts down there. Um, I, think, I think my favorite probably the... Uh, the hack into shield and shut down the helicarrier. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is my favorite. The challenge that you have, um, and this might this is kind of me reaching into the perfect area, so if I, if I overstep, you know, feel free to like shoot me with a knockout arrow. <laughs> <laughs> the challenge with arrows are not like see, are exceedingly are exceedingly complicated. Part of when they're traveling traveling through the air. There is there's oscillations going on with the arrow. The materials that arrows are made out of are designed to move in a certain way so that they have accuracy and you travel over distance. So if you are making any kind of trick arrow, you have to account that you have to have the material that has still that flexibility to move, but also durable enough to hit the target and not simply just shatter. So something like also the size of the arrowhead affects affects aerodynamics. So for something like the, the, the hack into shield and, re and the shut down the healthcare area arrow is one of the more feasible ones if, since if you can get, if the target is if it's small enough and you can get the circles small enough to just make it pop out and stick into the right spot, that could be small enough in a focused enough area around the head that it would not interfere with the arrow's ability to actually function. Some of the more elaborate things, ex an explosive arrow, like these are things that, that we can make. You can put a small charge on the tip of an arrow. I think it's illegal in most uh, hunting. Um, <laughs> but that is something that can be done, but one of the more elaborate mechanisms that kind of spring out of the arrow, that's something that's going to be good, be very, really pretty arrow in the field travel. On the boomerang arrow, the thing, boomerang in comic books, oh gosh. Um, <laughs> I'm going to jump a little bit away from, uh, from Marvel, listen to an episode of of a Batman animated series where uh, Tim Drake, the, at the time the smallest Robin, picks up a batarang and just playing with it and says, I don't use a batarang, throws it, it spins around, cuts through three stalactites in the bat cave, comes back and catches it. <laughs> <laughs> Boomerangs, 
they didn't, any, kind of, any kind of throwing stick or rabbit stick. These were things that you threw them and you, you retrieved them by going and picking them up after it hit the thing you were trying to knock unconscious so you could, you could eat it. <laughs> Once it hits an object, you have, you have now, like, like, with, like with pool, you have now changed its momentum, you've changed its trajectory to be able to throw it in such a way that it's a, that is a lot of that is a lot of math. And every time it hits an object, it is losing momentum. And as a, and a human being, can only put so much, even a bow, can only put so much momentum into an object, especially if you're going to be hitting something hard enough to knock out a person. People are, though we seem fragile, we're kind of durable. As as a, as a mission in the UFC, it's hard to knock someone unconscious. It can take a while. And so the idea of being able to shoot something out, how to be able to suddenly uh, change change directions, and have still have enough force to really do any damage to a normal human being, let alone someone who can who has Spider-Man strength, that's just not very feasible, and you're probably just always proud of the gun. <laughs> All right. So just sitting here, I suddenly think figured out how to I would make a boomerang. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I have been doing the same. So thing. you have you have in the head you have this mobile device that is inert up until the the top of the arc of the arrow, uh, of the arrow's flight, and then the gyroscope starts spinning. <laughs> and so you start changing the internal, the total angular momentum of the arrow, so that in order to maintain zero, the same <laughs> angular momentum before, it's got to reverse its trajectory and come back. And so that's gonna be my hand waving way. My favorite, Trick Arrow, though, has to be coming actually from Green Arrow, DC, where in the comic books he had an underwater adventure and he used his scuba tank arrow. Do you see why you might want to have a scuba tank if you're going to fight someone underwater? What advantage it would be to put it on the tip of an arrow? <laughs> you can't possibly imagine. <laughs> All right, I think we've covered as many arrows as we're going to. Sir, I believe you have an objection. Um, how does the human torch lighting itself on fire allow him to fly? How does the human torch lighting itself on fire allow him to fly? He rises, right? When the torches kick in for being on fire, it allows your brain to go into these wonderful different <laughs> Um, I, I can give a bit of this. Um, so it is unclear what the fuel source is uh, for him being on fire, but it seems to be plentiful. Um, so if he is using that source and directing it out of some kind of nozzle, uh, <laughs> then just like any other rocket, <laughs> be the, the mass being ejected behind him uh, would uh, be enough to gain momentum in the forward direction. Uh, so yeah, as long as he's got enough fuel, uh, the mass exchange works just like any rocket taken off the pad. Doesn't this kind of point out the fact that the typical fantasy dragon is kind of wired backwards? Point <laughs> <laughs> well made. Clearly Iron Man at the back. How does the Flash travel in time, particularly uh, relating to the Legends of Tomorrow series and more physics-based, how does he pass through the bulk? Or does he absolutely know uh, the laws of quantum gravity? Um, all right, so here's the question. How does the Flash travel in time? And this man did not read the description of the panel. Flash is DC. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe we all know DC is bullshit. So. <laughs> Question anyway, for the sake of speculation, uh, can a guy who can run really fast travel in time? Uh, uh, does he ever know that? I thought he kept out of Mark III. I mean, he travels in time all the time, but I didn't think it was run running really fast. Regardless, going really fast, traveling in time. Does he run faster than the speed of light? 
Sure. No, you can't. <laughs> Why not? What's bad about running faster than the speed of light? That is the cost of speed limit. Nothing but mass can run faster than the speed of light. This is something every geek out there knows, including you, I suspect. Yes. Well, yes, but I have to ask you the question because some of these people aren't uh, that, like haven't hit that level of geek geekitude yet, where they had to run that equation and go, oh, uh, if the flash gets up anywhere See, close to the speed of light, it weighs more than the Earth. You know, <laughs> Heavier and heavier you get, the more and more energy it, ke it takes to keep accelerating. You can actually see this in your, in your the gas mileage on your car. Um, it takes a lot more gas to maintain 70 miles an hour than it does to maintain 40 miles an hour um, because it just takes more energy. And you just hit a level where it just becomes infinite. The calculations just kind of blow up, and that happens basically at, at you know at when you're traveling at the speed of light. Now, the benefit of that is that if you want to go forward in time. That's completely physically legitimate. We're all time travelers this very moment. <laughs> well, no, no, but I mean, he can, he can leap forward. We're all time travelers going a second per second. But he can go faster than that because if he ran at, say, you know, 99, 99999999% the speed of light for several days, at that speed, he only several days would have passed for him. But due to time dilation, everyone around him, a thousand years would have passed. Now once he stops, he can't go backwards in time and be consistent with, with uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. Um, this was also related, addressed in another letter to Superman Comics back in the 50s. Again, DC. Well, <laughs> but it, it, it's relevant in the sense that some physics students from MIT wrote in and said, in a recent issue, Superman was shown going faster than the speed of light. Einstein's theory says that nothing can go faster than light. How do you explain this? And Mort Weisenberg, the editor, said, Einstein is just a theory. Superman is fact. <laughs> That's usually the, the, the fail state that everybody, if that's a hand waiting that everybody uses, we don't actually have a theory of quantum gravity, so one day warp drive might be possible, for example. Um, probably unlikely, but it is true that we do not have a working theory of quantum gravity, and we don't really have a good idea what that might look like, so yes, that's a nice little hand waiting way to go. All right, I think any questions are going to go one, two, three. I just see an arm, so whoever has their arm, that's you, okay. So, one. If we have time to get them. Okay, musical devices. We have Guardians of the Galaxy. He's listening to a cassette tape over and over and over. And the majority of us in this room that are old enough to remember cassette tapes, <laughs> you wear them out. He's obviously been listening to this for 20 odd years. <laughs> also, so there's the magnetic properties where he's flying around in space, and that's going to be affected. And then also, uh, in Quick, with Quicksilver in Days of Future Past, listening to his Walkman, and it is the, it's playing at the speed that he's running. <laughs> yeah. I find it fascinating that in Guardians of the Galaxy, the part that you that actually brings up something I think you were talking about in a panel yesterday, is the thing that will always break your sense of disbelief in a movie is the thing you're an expert on. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's right. so That's the thing you know cassette tapes don't work that way. Uh, the, like any other scene, you're like, well, whatever. Um, <laughs> rim was death to me because they kept talking about the engineering and their robots, and everything they said was not only wrong, it was shockingly wrong. <laughs> but I turned, but I turned to the left to my computer programmer friends, and they're like, oh my goodness, you thought like hear about how their computers were working? Like, what? No! <laughs> <laughs> with the movie? Um, but yeah, entropy is like a thing. Uh, I really wanted to see your face when, when they uh, fell from space and, and landed and they were okay. I, was, I wish I could have been there for, for your expression too, but I wish I could have seen mine. Uh, no, my, I, was, I had a notepad out and I was doing calculations. <laughs> uh, it, it's even better, they gave numbers. <laughs> Alright, um, who's number two? There you are. 
Oh god, uh, yeah, your face is in your palm already. Let's start with you. <laughs> this seems to be my, my standard response all week. Um, okay, so helicopters are really, really cool. Um, and there's the, 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 what fascinates me about helicopters is that the physics is still very, very weak. Um, as far as our, our complete understanding of the rotor mechanics um, is, is, is astoundingly weak compared to what we know about fixed wing aerodynamics. Um, basically, I can't envision any way that they could have four rotors that would actually hold that thing up. I don't even know why you would bother. <laughs> uh, yeah, it looks cool, but we have, what, seven aircraft carriers that stay in the water, and the really cool thing is if they, for some reason, ran out of power, they're just going to sit there. <laughs> uh, it's sort of like the, the problem with flying cars, right? So, um, really cool. I can't even be, I've tried to do the calculations on that, and it's just outrageous. But this is actually why we don't have flying cars. It takes a tremendous amount of energy to lift something up off the ground and keep it off the ground. And say for an automobile, by the time you do that, you have no energy left over to get from point A to point B. So it's it's a flying parked car. <laughs> and I'm going to take that as a real quick segue into my other big gripe with, with a lot of comic book material is, again, energetics. You know, the Human Torch, or Magneto, or whoever it is, Quicksilver, the, the sheer amount of calories that these people would have to ingest in order to do the stuff they're doing. If you're curious about what, how much fun is it to have to consume, say, 10 to 20,000 calories per day, you know, most of us, we should consume maybe 1,500 to 2,500, depending on our activity, find somebody who suffers from cystic fibrosis. Because of the, the disease condition, they can't absorb calories properly, and they generally ingest something on the order of 10,000 calories a day, and they're still scrawny. <coughs> it's a miserable situation for them. So, for to be like the Human Torch and have to eat, you know, I don't, I don't even know how many hamburgers you would have to consume to, to be able to do what he does. And that's just, and that's just if we're using normal metabolism. If we start to try to say you've got a fusion engine inside you. Uh, that's fine, but then you have a fusion engine inside. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's a solution that causes many more problems than it solves. Um, um, I, actually, on that, the, the, the third option, the one that they've been going with a lot in comics, which is even more terrifying, effectively, that all these characters are essentially black holes. <laughs> that makes the opposite of sense. <laughs> <laughs> extra mass that they get from growing or where it goes when it, where it goes when it uh, when they shrink comes from some extra extra space some extra dimension that we do not cannot really interact with but they have some connection to so they are effectively that person is some grid between our plane of our, our, yeah, our plan of existence and and another plan of existence where there is an either infinite amount of of of, inner, of sorry, electrical energy Punch energy. <laughs> so we're so, 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 so um, going, going full on multiverse. Well, I, the, it is a full on multiverse. It's just really depressing to be like, in some other universe, Bruce Banner's like, I can't punch anything because other Bruce Banner keeps getting angry. <laughs> <laughs> This, I believe, is going to be our very last question. I'd already pointed at some vague human face in the crowd there. Who was, there's, there's vague human face in the crowd. So I was wondering how possible the uh, three-dimensional heads-up displays from Iron Man are, and if we're gonna see anything like that actually happen. Oh, that's a good final one. I really think this isn't just, oh, God. Um, <laughs> also, I feel really bad, because I, I am good friends with that vague face in the back of the audience that I didn't recognize. <laughs> Displays um, in front of it that uh, is going on with Iron Man. Actually, I can All right, that. Uh, you saw something similar also in Minority Report, and the guy who served as head to consultant on that, um, John Undercoppler, actually does have technology and development to do things like that. 
Obviously, the version that Tony Stark is using is extremely advanced, but I think that is something that we might eventually see one day, uh, or at least a version of it. And certainly, we have the gestural interfaces and how he moves it. It's, it's, a, it's a dream technology, and it's not there yet, but that is definitely where they are trying to go. Into the microphone, sir. In the heads. Oh, don't the fighter pilots all right now have on their displays a lot yes. of the dashboard information? Which you also see uh, that uh, the suit also has. Right. Yeah, that's that's two dimensional, but yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's three D. Being able to manipulate in three D is what they would ultimately like to do. And it looks like it's sort of holographic. I can ask the engineer to speak to that. Um. So there's a shorter answer. I own one. Actually, my roommate owns one. The Oculus Rift is capable of all of that. A Kinect and an Oculus Rift currently has the capacity to make a 3D holographic display for the user. Now the thing that uh, isn't probably ever going to happen because it's a pointless waste of energy is having a holographic display that one person can use and a casual observer will see that same 3D interface that the person is seeing. So that hover table um, that like all of the hologram sort of grows out of and everybody sort of walks around, it makes much more sense for somebody to put, for everybody to put on a set of glasses that makes it all individually for that person um, because it takes way less energy. We know that person has everything focused, it's coming up on their glasses, they see what's going on. So that technology exists, you can get one and it's really creepy. If you haven't tried an Oculus Rift, they're really neat. They're not perfect yet, but you can see how close we are to that sort of magical future where you just kind of go dook, dook. <laughs> and it looks like it's real. Um, I think the, uh, the best Oculus Rift demo that I've seen that really explains how weird our perceptions are is it's when you're just sitting at a desk, you look this way and you go, oh, there's my keys, and there's my, uh, there's my flower, and there's my donut, and there's my fern. And where's my desk? <laughs> <laughs> and things just change when you're not looking at them. Um, so I think that brings us out to the end of our panel. Uh, does anybody want to plug things they're doing this weekend, things they're doing in real life, places they should go, people they should talk to? Let's start right down at the end. Where's your blog? How do we find you? What else are you doing? Uh, well, uh, my blog is at Back to Wakanda on Tumblr. I may be a Black Panther fan. <laughs> I'll be in the uh, Blackbird Mission as Dystopia later this evening at 8.30 and this is generally warming around if you'd like to ask any questions or uh, chit chat with anyone. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can find me at wired.com and I brought these along in case anybody asks about ant communication. So if you would like to smell an ant. I highly recommend it. <laughs> on the physics of Van Man on uh, tomorrow at 11 o'clock, I think in this room, and uh, otherwise also the physics of superheroes. Um, I uh, am going to be talking at sessions right after this on Manhattan, the TV show that's set in uh, the uh, Manhattan Project era. Um, you can find me at Scientific American, talk to pretty physics. You can also find me on Twitter, generally. Uh, I'm Ryan Consul. You can find me just by Googling my name, I'm the only one there is. Uh, if you had any questions or comments about this panel, you can find me at Student of Whim on Twitter with all of your butt actuallys, and I will proceed to ignore them completely. Um, I have a couple other panels, uh, but they have nothing to do with this subject, so just look them up if you think I'm funny. Tober. Uh, I'll be uh, in Atrium 7 tomorrow uh, talking about human augmentation, um, sort of blending off of some of the stuff we've done today. And uh, I'm really bad at social media, but I am at Topher underscore Hunter at Twitter. Um, if you see once, uh, once every six months when I actually bother to tweet. Um, <laughs> otherwise, I write at Grounded Parents. All right. Thank you all for being such a wonderful audience.